Well, I want to talk to you today about one of the most neglected areas of the Christian life, and that is the area of the mind. Jesus commanded us in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And for many of us, you know, our faith is an emotional faith. It's reliant on feelings and emotional experiences. And we have neglected loving God with our minds. And we do so to our detriment. Oh, next slide, please. Oh, next. Next. There we go. Harvard professor and a former ambassador to Lebanon, Charles Malik, stated this. He said, I must be frank with you, the greatest danger confronting American evangelical Christianity is the danger of anti-intellectualism. The mind in its greatest and deepest reaches is not cared for enough. The result is that the arena of creative thinking is vacated and abdicated to the enemy. Next, for the sake of greater effectiveness in witnessing to Jesus Christ himself, as well as for their own sakes, evangelicals cannot afford to keep on living on the periphery of responsible intellectual existence. And the results of neglecting the nurture of our mind has been absolutely devastating to the church and especially to that next generation. Surveys uh, from some of the top ministry organizations have shown that we are really paying the price for neglecting our minds. Recent surveys show that 80% of young people who profess Christ in high school abandon their faith after four years of college. They go into the arena unprepared for the challenges and their novice arguments are quickly demolished when they meet the high-level arguments of their professors and classmates on the university and high school campus. Other surveys, George Barna in this great book, Think Like Jesus, he's a Christian sociologist who does studies with uh, evangelical churches and he surveyed evangelical, these are good Bible teaching churches now, and he discovered only 10% of Christians even have a biblical worldview. In other words, 90% of the evangelical community thinks exactly like the culture around them. Only 2% of Christian teenagers even have a biblical worldview. And what was even the most shocking part is less than 50% of pastors have a biblical worldview. How can we transform the world when we look exactly and we think like the world? Soren Kierkegaard, the great Danish philosopher, says when the church thinks like the world, then the church has lost its soul. And instead of being salt and light to the darkness around us, we've been salted and licked. Instead of transforming the culture or being a beacon of righteousness and light and truth, the culture is transforming the church. So for this reason, it's important that Christians not only develop the heart, but also the mind. And grow in their understanding of the Christian worldview, of Bible, of theology, and apologetics. Knowing why they believe. And we're so delighted Awana is here and Child Evangelism Fellowship to start this process from a very young age. But it needs to continue all the way through the Christian life. So let me give you three reasons today why, as Christians, we need to develop the minds. By first understanding the reasons for our faith in Christ. 1 Peter 3.15, Peter writes this, But set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that you have, yet to do this with gentleness and respect. Peter tells us that our faith 
in an unbelieving world, in rebellion to God, will always be questioned and scrutinized by the unbelieving world. Can your faith face and answer the challenges that come upon it? And our faith is challenged each day by the unbelieving world, in the media, at work, by our friends at school, our colleagues at the workplace, and especially for the students in high school and the university campus, it's a place where faith faces some of its most serious challenges. But also there will be times in, in your personal life uh, when things will happen that will cause you to question your faith. Is it really real? Is there really a God? Is He really good? And it's at those times you'll discover the true metal of your faith. You see, an emotional faith is only going to take you so far. Sooner or later, you're going to need some good reasons upon which to hang your heart and your faith upon. You know, George Barna did a recent survey of why teens are leaving the church. And there's an epidemic there uh, in the United States that teens are leaving the churches in droves. And he did a survey on the top six reasons why young people are leaving the church and the answers surprised everyone. The first one was churches are overprotective. They demonize everything. Oh, don't, don't study uh, Darwinian evolutionary. It's demonic, demonic. Oh, don't watch that movie. It's of the devil. Okay, oh, but all my friends are, oh, no, no, don't watch it. Don't, oh, it's, gonna, it's of the devil. Oh, don't read that book. Oh, it's of the, de this is of the, that's of the devil. You know, it's like we're scared of the world and its ideas around us. And, and the church demonizes everything. And the, and the teens are asking, why am I afraid of this idea? Why am I afraid of this book? Why am I afraid to go and watch and, and critique this movie? Second, the experience of Christianity is too shallow. Our young people are asking deep questions. Why is the universe here? How did it all begin? Things I'm learning in school seem to counter the Genesis account here. You know, you look at the things that they're studying. I mean, man, they are, uh, you know, creating robots and, and writing 20-page papers on this and that. And they come to church and, and, and you know, we, we play games for half an hour and give them a 10-minute devotion, you know. But they've got some deep questions that they're wrestling with. Can we challenge uh, their heart and their mind and address some of those deep issues that they're wrestling with? Third, the church is antagonistic to science. Now, there's a myth out there that science and Christianity are enemies. You can't be a serious scientist and be a serious Christian. Well, Christianity and science were allies for hundreds of years. In fact, it's the Christian worldview that gave birth to modern science. It's because we understood God to be a reasonable, rational God. He created an ordered universe with design and the design of the designer could be studied. That's why it's the Christian West that originated the sciences. Not the pantheist uh, religions of Asia. Okay? It's the Christian West that nurtured and developed the sciences. They've been allies for hundreds of years. Only in recent times they have been made to look like enemies. But <clears throat> it's now dominated by the naturalist worldview. But the, if you understand the sciences and you're equipped in the Christian worldview, you can see how science complements our faith in Christ. But when teens come to the church and they say, hey, we're, we're learning about the origin of life is not according to the Genesis account and the church just says oh don't don't read that stuff just ignore it or okay you know live a schizophrenic life all right okay believe that in academia but try to believe this you know when you come to church you know and they got to live in this schizophrenic world because the ch church doesn't want to address these kinds of issues <clears throat> and so uh, they find the church antagonistic to the sciences the view of sexuality is too simplistic. Why can't I have sex before marriage? We got safe sex now. What's the big deal? 
Why is God condemning gays when they're born that way? Why? My friend is born that way. Well, why is he in sin? Why is that a sin? Why would God make someone like that and say it's sin? I mean, we got to address those tough issues. They wrestle with the exclusivity of Christianity. Now that we are in a post-Christian culture, uh, and, and they're interacting with people from all the different religions, why is Jesus the only way? Now my grandfather died a Buddhist. Why is he separated from God forever? And finally, the church is unfriendly to those who doubt. They don't feel it's a safe place where they can come and raise their questions and have their questions seriously addressed. Instead, the church says, oh, don't, don't ask those questions. Just believe, just believe, okay? Well, <clears throat> they can go, you know, to, to the Mormon church, the Muslim church, the Buddhist church. And they'll get the same answer, you know? Oh, don't, don't question the Quran, just believe, you know? Don't question the lotus, just believe, you know? <laughs> if we have the truth, we do a great disservice when we don't take their questions seriously and don't seek to uh, answer the serious questions that they're asking. I, I, as a young person, you know, when I heard the gospel for the first time at 17 years old, you know, I grew up in a Buddhist faith, and first thing I asked, how do you know it's true? Great story. How do I know it's even, how do I know a guy named Jesus existed? And how do I know this is an accurate record of the life of Christ. It seems kind of hard to believe. This guy raising the dead, walking on water. You know, it kind of sounds like those other religions. How do I know this one is historical and those are not? But you notice these six. You notice something that they have in common. They have to do with the mind. Our young people are asking those questions. Right? It's not because church isn't fun. It's not because there's not enough good-looking girls. It's not because there's not enough good-looking guys. It's because they're wrestling with some serious issues and they're looking for answers if you look at those top six. And so the, our life application is this. The heart will not commit to what the mind is not convinced of. Okay, you got to be convinced before you're going to surrender your heart and soul and mind to something. All right? You got to be reasonably convinced. Okay, if I tell you, if you're looking for a car and I say, man, Toyota's the best car, go get the Toyota. Well, the first thing you're going to ask is, why? Uh, show me some studies. Are there some people that I can talk to? Okay, you need to be reasonably convinced before you're going to spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars on something like this. Well, how much more the things of truth and eternal life? The heart will not commit to what the mind is not convinced of. That's how we're designed. That's how God designed us. Heart and mind work together. Now, the second reason Christians need to develop their mind is that we are called to present compelling reasons to an unbelieving world. Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer. Hey, the Greek word there is apologia. That's where apologetics comes from, right? Apologetics is not saying I'm sorry all the time. I remember uh, I was talking to a lady and this guy said, this is Pat, he's in apologetics. And she said, good, there's a lot Christians need to apologize for. For. You know, and I said, no, no, apologetics. It's a legal term. Okay? It's used of a lawyer presenting his case before a jury. And it's a formal term in the Greek. It pictures a lawyer as he stands before the court presenting his case, presenting reasons and evidence for why his position is true. So here in 1 Peter, the language is of a courtroom. As a lawyer presents his case before the jury, he's presenting reasons why his position is correct. He says, to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason, the Greek word there is logos. Okay? It means well-reasoned argument. 
All right? It means to uh, give an account, a reasonable explanation for why you believe. So when you put the two together, logos and apologia, what Peter is saying is that your faith is on trial every day. The unbelieving world is watching. And when they come up to you and say, why should I believe in a carpenter from a small town in Israel who died a criminal's death, we need to give good, compelling reasons for why we believe. God never called us to make unreasonable, uh, unthinking, unreasonable kinds of decisions. When Christians are asked, we're called to provide compelling evidence and reasons for why we believe. You see, God is a rational God. He's a reasonable God. Right? He doesn't do things that are completely illogical. He doesn't make married bachelors or squared circles. And, and that's how He designed us. Okay? And we use our reasoning faculties every single day. When we make decisions, we look at the evidence, we process it through our reasoning minds, and we make a decision. Okay? For example, you go to a hotel and you got two elevators. One is dark, there's no music, you didn't see anyone going in and out. The elevator here on the left, however, there's music, there are lights, and you thought you saw people going in and out. Well, which elevator are you going to use? Well, obviously, this one. Why? Well, you examine the evidence, you process it through your reasoning faculties, and you took a step of faith in the direction where the evidence leads you, okay? Still takes faith to step into that elevator, may not work, but you have good reason to go in that direction, okay? That's biblical faith. Biblical faith is not a blind leap in the dark, all right? Uh, there's nothing true about it, but I'm just going to jump anyway. No, biblical faith, as Ravi Zacharias always teaches us, is taking a step in the direction where the evidence leads. So we use reason. We look at evidence all the time. That's how God designed us. Okay, if I tell you, okay, uh, uh, you should come to Molokai Baptist Church, all right, first thing your friend is going to say is, why? Tell me why. Okay, that's just uh, the way we think. Why is it then, when it comes to faith in Christ, we're supposed to throw all that out the window and just take a blind leap in the dark? You know, God designed us that way. And today in the West, we live, we have been living in a post-Christian culture for a long time. And in our post-Christian culture, this culture today views Christianity as an irrelevant religion made up of myths and legends of a bygone era. In fact, not only is Christianity viewed as false, it is now viewed as evil and pernicious and dangerous and it must be stomped out. Robert Brooks, a writer of the New York Times, writes this. He says, Christianity is in decline in the United States. The share of Americans who describe themselves as Christians and attend church is dropping. Evangelical voters make up a smaller share of the electorate. Members of the millennial generation are detaching themselves from religious institutions in droves. The Supreme Court's gay marriage decision landed like some sort of culminating body blow onto this beleaguered climate. Rod Dreher says this, he says, uh, <clears throat> it's time for Christians to strategically retreat into their own communities where they could keep the light of faith burning through the surrounding cultural darkness. In other words, Robert Brooks is saying, Christians, <clears throat> you're being beaten up by the culture around you. You can't stand against the ideas of the culture. So it's time. If you want to preserve Christianity, don't come out and engage the culture. Retreat. Get behind your walls of safety and stay on your reservation. 
Okay, there at least you can preserve your culture. Don't come off the reservation and try to engage the culture. Because if you do, you're going to lose. All right? So stay, protect yourselves behind your walls and just stay there if there's any hope of preserving Christianity. <clears throat> Dr. Robert Coons, a professor at the University of Texas, describes the atmosphere of the university campus today. He says, it's gotten increasingly hostile toward the Christian faith, especially in the classroom. When I was a student, the vast majority of teachers were not Christian, but a lot of people had the attitude that faith is a good thing and we're not going to knock it. But nowadays, the view among many of the faculty is that Christianity is not only misguided and false, but actually pernicious and evil and should be stamped out. Any student arriving at almost any college or university today will face that kind of attitude. So in our post-Christian culture, often it's not enough just to present the gospel. We've got to provide compelling reasons why we should be taken seriously. You know, just a few years ago, I was on the campus of Cornell University. It's one of the Ivy League schools. Any Cornell people here? Mm. Well, uh, all the Ivy League schools were started originally as Bible colleges and seminaries, right, to train young men for the new frontier, except Cornell. Cornell is strictly a secular school. There's no chapel on that campus. And I remember before I went to speak, we were walking around on that campus, and it's, you know, it's upstate New York, beautiful waterfalls surround the campus. But on all the bridges, there's these like bars, like jail bar, you know. And I finally, about the fifth, sixth one I saw, I asked the, my uh, um, university buddy, I said, hey, how come you got these ugly bars on these beautiful bridges? And he said, well, it's because a high number of students commit suicide here at Cornell. <clears throat> in fact, in the Ivy League community, Cornell is called Suicide University. You know, isn't that uh, uh, ironic? The stronghold of atheism, where Carl Sagan and Provine and Asimov and some of the great atheist thinkers came from, that uh, you'd have, you know, such a uh, atmosphere there. Well, I was going to be there in what we call the lion's den. And the lion's den is where I go up there and for 20, 30 minutes I present why I am a Christian. And then for the next 45 minutes, students get to ask me whatever question they want. And so we didn't know what to expect, okay? I'm not Ravi, I'm not Billy Graham, you know, I'm just some dude from Hawaii, you know. And so we were going to be there in their ecumenical hall there and uh, the atheists, no, the Muslims were upstairs, the Jewish group was downstairs and everybody praying against us and all that. So we didn't know what to expect or who would show up. Well, came that night, the auditorium was completely packed with hundreds of students. In fact, several hundred, they had to open up an overflow room and, you know, Cornell, they're smart, right? So they patchworked in the video right away. About 20 minutes, they got it up and going. Okay? And uh, I went up there and presented why I am a Christian. And then for the next hour, all right, students were asking me all kinds of questions. How does a loving God torture people in hell forever? And <laughs> all kinds of questions, and I was answering it. And then at the end, I gave a gospel presentation, and we closed in prayer. Well, after that, uh, many students came up and continued to ask more questions. That was great. I stuck around for another hour and a half, two hours, I think. But then at the end, a bunch of Christian students came up to me. One guy came up to me, and he was from Hawaii, so we had a connection. And he said, you know, I've been a Christian here on campus for four years, and I've never shared that fact with anyone. Because I didn't think my faith could stand up to the challenges of the university camp. This is the first time I've seen that my faith can meet the challenges of the university campus. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Another girl came up to me and she says, I'm a graduate student. I'm, a, I'm actually a missionary kid from Africa. And all these years, I've never shared my faith on this campus because I was afraid that it would get squished and demolished because I didn't think it could meet 
the challenges that I face here on the universe. You're the first person I've ever seen that could come here and show us Christianity can meet the challenges and has the best answers uh, for the questions we are asking. And Christian student after Christian student was coming up to me and saying, yeah, I've never mentioned that I was a Christian. In fact, I don't even go to church. I don't want my friends to know. Man, this is the first time I've seen that my faith can meet the challenges here of the university campus. You know, and a small revival, you know, broke out uh, after that on the university campus. And that's what we see in the lives of individual Christians and churches around the world when we do this. That there's a little revival that awakens the heart of believers when they realize that my faith is not some blind leap in the dark. It's got, com it's got overwhelming and compelling evidence that supports its case. And it can meet and answer the questions and the challenges of the culture around me. And they gain, gain more confidence to engage their culture and world for Christ, knowing that even if I don't have the answers, I can go somewhere and I know I can find some answers. And a little revival breaks out uh, in the heart of believers and revivals break out in churches. We've seen this, you know, all over the world. I can tell you story after story after story. So the application, oops, keep going. There's uh, another story we don't uh, have time for. There we go. Life application is this. Develop a reading plan. Developing the mind comes through hard work. Okay, there's no shortcuts here. If you want to be a great basketball player, well, you got to spend hours on the court. Right? You want to be a great cook, you got to spend hours learning how to cook. You want to be a good piano player, you got to spend hours on the piano. You want to uh, develop the Christian mind, well, you got to develop a reading plan. Okay, read. Great literature written by giants of the faith. And that will grow your mind and expand your minds as you wrestle with these giants. And, in, and it will grow your mind in ways you never thought possible. Men like uh, C.S. Lewis, a man who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, was an atheist for most of his life, came to Christ later in life, came one of the great scholars and defenders of the Christian faith. His books are classics. Francis Schaeffer, uh, burned out pastor, he retreated to Switzerland to get away from everything, and his kids would come home for the summer, and they brought their hippie friends home with them. And they would sit down and Francis Schaeffer would dialogue with them. And they were incredibly fascinated that here's an old Christian dude and he can dialogue about movies, art, literature, uh, apologetics, philosophy. They were just fascinated by this. And uh, the next summer, his daughter would come home and bring more of her hippie friends over. And they would sit down and dialogue all night with Francis Schaeffer on all kinds of issue, the philosophy uh, works they were reading, literature, movies, they were just fascinated how Christianity could address all of these issues and eventually she brought more hippie friends and pretty soon the Schaefer Labrie Institute was created in an obscure little town way up there in Switzerland and uh, the Labrie has produced some of the greatest scholars of our time. You know, Oz Guinness, Nancy Piercy and others. Okay, <laughs> Great uh, literature written there by Francis Schaefer. Darwin on trial there. Philip Johnson has turned the scientific world completely upside down and has brought the intelligent design movement on the university campus and has completely turned uh, the scientific argument completely upside down. You got others. Whoops, back one. I uh, hope that guy's good. There you go. <laughs> the giants of the faith today, you know. Uh, Norman Geisler. If there's a guy in apologetics, he's been trained by Norman Geisler somehow in some way. <laughs> Ravi, Darwin Hunt trial and others. Okay? <clears throat> Walk with the giants of the faith. Read, interact with them. Okay? Also, take time to read those who oppose our faith so that we know what the arguments are. And often their arguments can cause us to examine our faith, refine and strengthen our arguments. All right? It's tough reading, but hey, Look at what our students are reading. 
man, 15 year old kid, <laughs> he was reading stuff I was reading in college. You know, I mean, they're reading at that level. Yeah. Our young people are growing. We have to grow ourselves to address the issues that they are now facing, especially, you know, with the internet and all that they have access to. So develop a reading plan, okay? You might be sitting here saying, oh, I don't have the degrees you have. Well, hey, <clears throat> I was mentored. Okay? They've since passed away, but you know, when I was in graduate school, I was mentored by two men who never finished high school. You know, but they read voraciously not only the Word of God but other literature, and they mentored me for years. Uh, Danny Lane, your dad, does he have a college degree? It's one of the smartest guys I met. Always telling me about books he read that I haven't read. I was like, oh, well, I got to go get that book. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, you can develop the mind and, and don't be intimidated just because you don't have a degree. Okay? Wouldn't it be great man, if we had a team of in the medical field here that could address the medical issues coming down the pike. We, we just voted on a euthanasia bill there in Oahu. Wouldn't it be great if the Christian medical doctors got together, wrote a one-page newsletter or something on the church website that says, here's our position against euthanasia, right? Here's the positions Christians should have, you know? <clears throat> what about those uh, in the political field? You know, we're debating on Kavanaugh. Well, what is a constitutional judge? What, what is all this? What, you know, as Christians, I mean, as a church, you can't endorse a candidate, but you can say, here are the issues. And here's how you should... Well, it'd be great. We had guys in political science, savvy political... Can uh, address that issue, put a blurb in the church bulletin or on the church website. Or those of you in the arts, you know, hey, big movie has hit town, Avatar. That's a great opportunity, you know, to share Christ. You know, Avatar. Here's the theme of the movie. Here's the plot. And here's the theme. It's a search for the Garden of Eden. All right? And to find the garden, to restore the environment, you have to be like the Navi. You've got to worship nature. If you worship nature, we're going to get Eden again. Is that true? Is that the true message? Who can address it? You know? Man, I got standing room only crowds when I, I come and talk about Avatar. Everyone wants to know, what's, what's Christians got to say about the environment? Never heard anyone talk about the environment. Hey, wouldn't it be great if we had groups like that in this church? Church or here in Molokai, being able to address those kinds of issues as Francis Schaeffer did. Okay. And the final reason that Christians need to develop their mind, oops, next one, is that we must know and identify and refute the false ideas of the culture around us. 2 Corinthians 10.5, Paul says, we demolish every argument and pretension, or we demolish strongholds and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of Christ, and we take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. Now the word demolish there, the Greek word kataskato, means to dig down to the foundations and completely overturn. And Paul is giving us the picture of an army attacking a castle. Before you can take the captives inside, you got to demolish the strongholds that protect those inside. Once you overturn uh, those protective walls, then you can go into the castle and take captive those inside. And Paul is saying the mind is like a castle. There are these walls of protection that keep people from taking the message of the gospel seriously. And what are those protective walls? They are the false ideas of the culture all right, that keep people from taking your message seriously. And often what you have to do before someone will take you seriously is you've got to demolish those strongholds. All right? Often when we're dialoguing with people, people say, well, there's no such thing as truth. Everything's relative. Boom, that shuts you down right away. Well, you got to know how to overthrow that. Oh, no, no, you Christians believe in that Adam and Eve stuff. Darwin has shown you how life came from non-life and how natural forces create the universe we have around us. So, 
I don't believe that mythology stuff. Well, you got to be able to overthrow those strongholds before uh, you can address the issues they are facing and before they'll take you seriously. Remember, the gospel is never preached in isolation, but it's preached in the context of a culture and its ideas. Okay, and those ideas are powerful ideas and they often oppose the message of Christ. And today in our culture, we have uh, Darwinian evolutionary theory that teaches the origin and diversity of the life are the result of natural causes acting randomly. You've got the new atheist movement, aggressive evangelistic atheists employing a lot of our tactics on us. Relativism, no such thing as truth. Novels like the Da Vinci Code, man that presented the greatest opportunity to share the gospel all over the world if we were equipped. Okay? Instead of running from that novel, we should have all been running to that novel. I got flown all over the world to address the issues of the Da Vinci Code. People wanted to hear, is there a Christian that can answer these challenges? I was being invited to universities, to law schools, to businesses, to liberal, liberal, liberal churches that would never let me in the parking lot. Okay? But they're inviting me to come to address these issues. The new tolerance, pluralism, all religions are equally valid and true. Often we've got to address these issues and demolish these ideas before people will take us seriously. Now, I remember I was speaking uh, somewhere in Chicago, I can't remember what college we were at, and uh, I was presenting my case on the authority and inspiration of the Bible when a young man, Gordon, stood up at the Q&A time and he says, I don't believe a word you said. There's no such thing as truth. Everything is relative. All that you said is just your opinion. And I said, there's no such thing as truth. Is that what you just said? He said, yeah, there's no such thing as truth. I said, there's no such thing as truth. And he said, yeah, I told you. No such thing. I said, okay, I'm going to repeat it one more time. There's no such thing as truth. He said, yeah, there's no such thing as truth. And I said, is that a true statement you just made? <laughs> and he started shaking. <laughs> He said, I got an answer for you. And he ran out the door. <clears throat> and so I was addressing other questions. And he comes running back in and he says, All right, here's the definition of truth. And he read, Truth is relative. Truth is created by the individual. And, and he read his definition. And he said, That's the definition of truth. That's why it's all relative. And I said, Is that definition true? And he started shaking. He was getting really mad. He said, I can't believe in Christianity because you Christians condemn and hate homosexuals. And I said, is it wrong to hate people because of their lifestyle? He said, yeah, it's wrong to do. I said, is it wrong for me to do? He said, yeah, wrong for you. So what about him? Is it wrong for him? Yeah, it's wrong for him. What about her? Is it wrong for her to do? Yeah. Is it wrong for everyone? Yeah. Absolute number two. Wow, went from zero to two. And he started shaking and getting really angry. And I said, Gordon, I'll talk to you later, okay? Just relax. We'll, we'll chat later. So later we sat down and we talked for about an hour and a half, okay? And I didn't know. He was the uh, church atheist there, going around churches, uh, uh, blasting all their arguments. Uh, I mean, uh, not church, the Christian fellowships on that campus. So we sat down and talked for about an hour and a half. Well, then that night I was presenting the case for the resurrection and Gordon came. And his countenance was completely different. It was totally different. And this time when he came to Q&A, he said, I got one more question for you. I said, sure, Gordon. He said, God know everything? I said, yeah, God knows everything. Past, present, future? Yeah, past, present, future. He said, did God know man would sin and disobey him, screw up, and cause all this evil and suffering in the world? I said, yeah, God knew that. He goes, then why did God create man in the first place? And the man walked right into the gospel presentation. Okay? And you could see a new openness in the way he was asking and the way we started interacting. So often, like Paul says, you got to demolish those strongholds before people will take you seriously. So the application is this. You know, the Christian not only has to learn what they believe and why they believe, but you need to be familiar with the ideas of the culture that you're going up against, that your children and grandchildren are going up against that oppose the gospel of Christ, okay? And you're not alone on this, okay? You're not alone. 
You've got some great resources for you there. Hope Evidence and Answers will be a great resource for you. But also, you've got a group like Probe, a ministry I worked for for 20 years. A team of scholars, scientists, education experts, guys in political science. So over a thousand articles <coughs> from which you can read. Nick, yeah, those of you in the sciences, here's a great one. Reasons to Believe. Hey, Hugh Ross and Fuzz Rana and other top scientists addressing the issues of science. Okay? <clears throat> You've got all kinds of great resources there for you. If you want to know how to uh, how to uh, communicate clearly the gospel to children. Okay? You got two guys, uh, uh, two families here that uh, can equip you for that task. A lot of resources there for you. And remember, loving God involves our entire being, our heart, our soul, and our mind. You know, church historians have wondered how it was that the first century church transformed the Roman Empire so quickly and Christianity became the dominant ideology of the Western world for uh, over a millennia. With no army, with no political power, how was it that Christians were able to conquer the Roman Empire? And my church history professor probably said it the best. He said Christians were able to conquer the Roman Empire because they could outlove and outthink the culture around them. And when you have that combination, that's an unbeatable combination. When you can outlove and outthink the culture around you. So more than ever in our post-Christian age, we need churches and we need a generation of Christians who can do the same, can outlove and outthink the culture around them. And when you got churches and ministries and Christian men and women who can do that, that's an unbeatable combination. You'll have a message that the world just cannot ignore. So let's make a commitment today to develop not only our heart, but our mind for the glory of Christ. Let's pray together.